Thank you, Leith. And it's great to be with you all here uh, tonight for me, uh, or whatever time it is for you. Um, in Australia, we traditionally uh, begin our meetings by acknowledging the traditional owners and the Indigenous people of the land on which we're meeting. And I want to do that today and extend it uh, to wherever all of you are, uh, are meeting today. Uh, I really recognise that Indigenous people bear a particularly high burden of pneumonia morbidity and mortality, and they're often neglected from pneumonia control efforts. And I think I saw at least one chat come up uh, bring, raising that point. So I think it's a good reminder for all of us. Now, today we've been celebrating tools and strategies for pneumonia control, some old, some new. We've heard about vaccines, both older ones and emerging, uh, new and emerging ones. We've heard about pulse, pulse oximetry, which has been around since the 1970s. We've heard a bit about uh, uh, lung ultrasound and some other pneumonia etiology things. And we've heard of the gross inequities in access for these essential tools and the potential impact if these could be made more widely accessible. Um, perhaps the oldest tool in our toolkit for pneumonia is humble oxygen therapy. It's now 250 years since oxygen was first discovered and over a, a century and a half since it became a staple part of pneumonia care. And yet for so many people, it remains a luxury item, particularly in poorer and more remote communities. This inequity in access to oxygen has been a lived reality for doctors, for nurses, for patients for decades, and yet it took a global respiratory pandemic to wake the rest of us up. Now, as a clinician and researcher devoted to improving oxygen access, the COVID pandemic has been both a tragedy and an opportunity. And I'm gonna assume that all of you have seen the headlines. You all know the enormous oxygen crisis that has been unfolding over the last couple of years. And hopefully you understand that this wasn't just brought on by the pandemic. The pandemic certainly exacerbated, but it was really uncovering something that's been here a long lot longer. But the COVID pandemic has also offered us the opportunity to fast track and scale oxygen initiatives in the hope that we can truly build back better. So today I want to go behind some of these headlines. I want us to reflect on what we've learned and look forward to what still needs to change. So I want to share one great legacy, what I think is one critical lesson we've learned and three things we need to do better. And I think you'll hear resonations with a number of the other speakers that have already spoken uh, today. So one great legacy. COVID's brought us lots of activity, lots of investment, but for me, the one great legacy of COVID is pulse oximetry. Prior to the pandemic, I'd been working with colleagues in Nigeria to introduce pulse oximeters to nurses working on pediatric wards. And for most of them, pulse oximetry was a fundamentally new concept. They'd never seen an oximeter, never been taught about it in nursing school. And initially they saw it as an added burden. We really had to learn what, what was needed for them to appreciate it as something that made their job easier, that would enable them to adopt it and use it to, to, as a routine vital sign. Now, COVID has made pulse oximetry visible. Pulse oximeters have become popular even for, for lay people to have at home. And making pulse oximetry mainstream really excites me for all those reasons that Asan said. Because as we found in Nigeria, just introducing pulse oximetry improved access to oxygen for hypoxemic patients and reduced mortality for children with pneumonia. And that's really something to be celebrated. Um, but of course, there's still big challenges. The latest data from Nigeria, for example, still shows that only a third of pediatric wards have a working pulse oximeter, and that's in, in hospitals. Uh, if you go down to primary care, it's, yeah. it's even more, it's less than 5%. We know that the quality of pulse oximeters is not good, and there are real concerns about accuracy in populations with deeply pigmented skin. But COVID has accelerated our slow progress with pulse oximetry, and I really hope it will be the tipping point on the road to universal access. At the start of the pandemic, there was a global clamour for ventilators. Many donors, including my own government here in Australia, spent small fortunes donating ventilators to other countries. While many of us in the space, as, as Eric said earlier, were saying, wait a minute, we need to, we save lives by getting the basics right. And I hope that this is one critical lesson that we've learned. Most severely ill patients with COVID and pneumonia and any other critical illness don't need a ventilator. They need much more simple respiratory support. Early in 2020, we wrote an opinion piece concluding 
that improving patient outcomes always hinges on doing the basics well. The COVID-19 pandemic offers the opportunity to refocus efforts on the basics of acute care, knowing that improvements in oxygen, as well as infection control, triage laboratory testing will benefit patients both now and in the future. And I absolutely stand by that today. We'll do much better to invest in getting all the basics of critical care right than to throwing complicated devices that may not even have the staffing or technician support or even power supply to operate. And I think while the acuteness of the COVID pandemic is gone, I really hope this is one lesson that will stay with us forget forever. We need to get the basics right. Okay, now to three things that I think we need to do better. First, we need to get better at fitting solutions to actual needs and context. Not parachuting grand innovations, but working to incrementally improve on what's in place. Now, early in the pandemic, this might not have been possible. Stuff just needed to be done. And that invariably meant misplacement and waste. Concentrators delivered to facilities without the staff or power supply to use it. Uh, PSA oxygen plants built without considering who'd operate it or who'd cover the costs of fuel to power the generator. Now, these images you see here, these, these are, are real, and I won't divulge identities or locations, but I will say that these issues are widespread. I've seen so many well-intentioned donations sitting un, unused or underused. I've seen so much new gear coming to displace pretty functional existing systems and then failing, leaving users with less than they had to start with. And this is not just from the little donors, this is from the big ones too. And I think the norm has unfortunately been to ship in solutions without understanding what already exists or how things are already work working. And I admit that I've been guilty of this too. So I think moving forward, we all need to get better at understanding what's already working and building on that. We need to get better at asking, what's the actual need? Is what I'm doing gonna make it easier or add more work? How's it gonna be sustained? Are there gonna be unintended effects I should be thinking about? And while there's always room for innovation, and I don't think this is the space for saviors or quick fix solutions. Oxygen has been around for hundreds of years, but we need a context sensitive approach. We need long-term sustained engagement with end users. And there's many of you here who are doing exactly that. And I know it doesn't often get recognized, but I really want to applaud your efforts and encourage you to keep it up. Uh, second, we need to support the people using and maintaining oxygen systems. We need to invest in the health workforce. No amount of equipment will change anything without the nurses and doctors to make sure oxygen gets to the right patients, the technicians and biomedical engineers to keep things running, and the support personnel to iron out all the inevitable challenges. No amount of equipment will solve underlying challenges with inadequate staffing, excessive staff rotation, unpaid wages and associated industrial action. We, we know the health workforce is critical, not just to oxygen and to child pneumonia, but to, to universal health coverage agenda more broadly. And I'd really encourage everyone who's in investing in, supporting or implementing activities around oxygen or pneumonia to keep the people at the center. And I don't just mean giving more training and giving more tasks. I mean, really support them to do their job easier and better. And third, I think we need to think longer term. The pandemic required an emergency response for oxygen and that brought many great capital investments, particularly to larger facilities in urban areas that were acting as COVID treatment centres. But now we really need to focus on sustainability. How do we cover ongoing operation costs, spare parts, personnel, fuel? Many countries have received large amounts of donor funding to build new oxygen plants. But the big test will be, how do they keep them running? And there's a real risk that many will not be able to do so. How do we reallocate underutilized equipment, oxygen equipment and infrastructure to smaller and less well-equipped facilities? I said before that COVID-related oxygen investments have typically benefited larger urban facilities. And the benefits will certainly not just trickle down to small facilities without a major shakeup. How do we build oxygen-related data collection forecasting, planning and budgeting into routine health information systems and government structures. This is hard work and messy, I know. And again, this is not work that's going to bring you or anyone accolades or awards, but it's so critically, critically important. And I really applaud all of you who are doing your bit. So oxygen is old, but it's still new. 
COVID has presented an opportunity to accelerate access to this essential therapy, but we still need to take advantage of this momentum. There's a long, long way to go. So whether you're a frontline worker trying to improve your local oxygen services or a, a funder looking to make transformational investments, whether you're a, a government trying to do more with less or a researcher seeking to support more informed decision making, I hope that today I've challenged you in some way to think about how you can continue being an oxygen access uh, champion. And uh, I'll finish off just with a, a little mention that we are doing a Lancet Global Health Commission on Medical Oxygen Security. Many of you on this call will already be involved, but if you're not, I'd really encourage you to link in, share what you're doing and help us get out your work and help us all work, to work together. Uh, to really make sure that when we're meeting again in a year or a couple of years, that we're really getting much closer to the, to the, to the vision of oxygen for all. Thanks.